right, so suppose you have something like this. A or B1 for Boolean is equal to, how about, hungry is equal to true or false, and then thirsty or, yeah, thirsty equals true or false. And then you're writing a while loop. And your while loop looks something like this. While not hungry and thirsty, Thursday, do something, whatever that something is. And for whatever reason, you feel like rewriting it like this. While not hungry and not thirsty. Okay, I'm going to rewrite this a little bit. Like, say you had that. And say you didn't like writing it with the not here, and you wanted to put the not in there instead. Well, you can, but you got to make a change. If you have this expression, not x and y, if you want to rewrite it, that becomes not x or not y, for reasons I'm not going to prove, not a logic class, you just have to take that as faith. Similarly, if you do not x or y and you feel like expanding it, then it becomes not x and not y, like that. So when you expand it, the, sign, the, uh, the operation changes as well. That's called the Morgan's Law. And if that makes sense, great. If it doesn't, throw it away, and we'll hit it again in a subsequent chapter, I believe. So, Vincent, I know you were working on something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Where you were expanding a, you know, something like that and wanting to set it up like that. So that's why. I think you were the one who did that. I don't think so. Nope, nope, you're saying you don't. All right. Somebody did it. I promised I would explain it. Could have even been in the C++ class. I agree. If I can write something and not use not, I'm happier. It, what I would do if I was going to write this to make it easier to understand, I would write this like this. Instead of saying not hungry and not thirsty, I would say while hungry equals false, and thirsty equals false. There's nothing wrong with using not, but it ties your brain up in knots. The more negatives you have in your expression, the harder it becomes for the human to understand and look at it and make changes you're to you're basically adding like four negatives on there, and you're going, you can't, you have to talk with every single negative to make sure it's equal. Right, positive. right. It's just hard to understand. The computer doesn't care, but we do, right? No, we're writing it, and we have to make sure it works. I'd rather write it like that. Especially, you know, if you're doing something like this, <laughs> your brain breaks when you're looking at it, in my opinion. I think I have some reference to Chapter 5 in my uh, homework descriptions or lecture descriptions, and I know we're not on Chapter 5, we're on 3, so... Let me correct that right now. We have a new video to watch, which is video four, but a video three. I didn't have anybody put any comments in the quizzes saying they hated the videos. So, <laughs> And this one's actually a little bit more pertinent. It doesn't focus so much on logic gates, and it talks about binary instead. So hopefully you'll like it. Just watch the video. It's listed over here in content. Well, actually not in the videos folder, but the whole playlist is linked there at the bottom of the content menu. So you can pick them out as you want, three, four, five, and whatever. And also in the quiz, I point you directly to it. So when you go and open the quiz, it gives you the URL to the video that I want you to watch, which is number four. The chapter quizzes have been posted. 
Chapter 2 has got a due date. Chapter 3 will have a due date if we finish Chapter 3 today, which is my hope. Simple quiz. It's over the chapter more than it's over my lecture. So read the uh, chapter, take the quiz, look things up in the book. Then you'll get a second chance of taking it when you're done. After I grade it. example. If we pop it open, and don't take it during class, but you know, unless I specifically gave you time to do that. Describe what this pseudocode statement does. Print account number equals plus account number. That's pretty easy. What does that do? It prints out the account number. <laughs> Provide an appropriate variable name for a variable that holds the average of a series of scores. Use the naming conventions for identifiers mentioned in the book in the class. So, I don't know, score average, excuse me, score average, something like that. Average score, that'd be good. A, that's kind of lame. You know, capital all caps, like that, average score, that's not so good. And that kind of looks old school, back when languages didn't support lowercase letter, you know, variable names. Anyways, you know, so basically the book recommends using camel case, which is starting with lowercase letters, and then if you have, you know, extra words in your variable name, capitalize in the first one, and make it kind of descriptive. And it's stuff like that. Provide an appropriate variable name for doing that. Write a line of pseudocode that forces, that tells the user to assign mass, time, speed into something called force. The term speed is horrible. That's not a physics term. It's F times MA, isn't it? Mass times acceleration. I need to rewrite that. But anyways, you could write this into a, a line of code, regardless of whether I got the formula variables correct or not, and so on. So it's not a killer quiz, hopefully. But if you get stuck on it, you can always ask me a question. So arithmetic operators, we know what addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division do. And I'm pretty sure that we've talked about promotion and demotion of types. But correct me on that if we have not. Have we talked about what happens when you're trying to convert data from one format to another or when the compiler needs to? So he's... Like putting an L on the end of the... Nope. Like if you're doing... Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure now that I haven't. If we do this, um, x is equal to 1 divided by 2. What is the difference between doing that and doing that? The one would give a, a 0 and the other would give a 0 0.5. It, it's exactly right. What happens is, is this is known as a binary operator because it requires two operands. It requires, you know, values on either side of it. If they are of the same type, the result will be of the same type. So since these are both integers, the result's going to be an int. It doesn't matter what you store this as. You know, you, uh, you could call this a super duper double, right? You know, <laughs> something that carried out a million digits of accuracy. This is still going to produce an int because... An int divided by an int is an int. If both operands are ints, then it performs that kind of operation and returns an int. What if they are mixed types? If they are mixed types, one is converted to the other. And there are rules based on how they're going to do it. They have to be of the same type or else the computer can't do it. Numbers are stored inside the computer in very different formats if they're floating point numbers than whether they are integers because a floating point number has a mantissa and an exponent and an integer doesn't. And so the circuitry just needs them to be of the same type. The, the uh, logical unit needs them to be of the same type. So the compiler fixes this for you so that they are both of the same type. Now, would it be a good idea for the compiler to change them both to ints? Or can't it turn the both to an int? Yeah, it would not change 2.2 to an int because it would lose that point too. 
So they're both converted to floats. And then the float happens, you know, the division happens, and you get a floating point result, which is stored in the Z. So that's called implicit conversion. So that first one, does it truncate? I mean, it would be 0.5. It would be so zero. It can't fit. So it's zero, it doesn't round up or something. Right, it doesn't round up. Okay. Exactly, right. So implicit conversion, when, or both operands, of a binary operator have to be of the same type. If they are not, I'm going to call it the lesser type is converted to the greater type. And lesser and greater doesn't mean values like 100 is greater than 90. It means the complexity. And the term converted is usually called promoted. The compiler does this for you. You don't. This is also known as implicit conversion or implicit casting. So I'm going to erase that, but I'm going to say just like Daniel said, this results in zero because it rounds down, and that this results in 0 0.5. And the answer is going to be the same regardless of whether it's 1 divided by 2.2 or 1.0 divided by 2.2, because before the operation, before the division occurs, they're both converted to floats. Now, usually that doesn't matter to you noticeably. Usually, you just trust the compiler to do the conversion for you. 99.999% of the time, you trust the compiler to do the conversion for you. The only one you really have to sweat is whether you're doing integer division or not, because that's the one that can round down if you're not careful, right? So if we do int x is equal to 3, int y is equal to 4, and int z is equal to x divided by y, right? But suppose this statement was buried way down in a whole bunch of other lines of code. Then when you looked at it, you may not know that those are two integers. You may be expecting it to produce a floating point result. You may expect that if zero, you know, x was 1 and y was 2, that you'd get 0 0.5 out of it. Well, you would. And if both of them are ints. So you just got to be careful of that. That's the only time that this really comes to bite you, in my experience, is this stuff about uh, implicit type conversion or not, which is that no conversion occurs if they're both ints. The result is an int. Why does that matter? Well, like the surface area of a sphere, or the volume of a sphere, I forget which, is 4 thirds times pi times r to the power of 3. So say I type that. Looks like a great equation. I can look it up. That's what it says. You're going to get the wrong answer if you use it. Why? Because that's a binary operator. The binary operands are checked. Are they of the same type? They sure are. They're both ints, and so it does integer division. And 4 divided by 3 rounded down is 1. That's not what you want. You want it to be 4 point, you know, 1.33333. So the best way to make sure that your mathematical ratios like that are calculated accurately is just to make it 4.0 divided by 3.0. So if an equation refers to 1 half x squared, make it 1.0 divided by 2.0, or you know you could just put 0 0.5, you know, or whatever. But you couldn't express this one exactly in floating point. You wouldn't want to put 0 0.333, you know, like that. Anyways, just be careful of integer division. You'll get the wrong answer. What if the formula was x is equal to 1 over 3 times y times y, right? Well, the first thing that happens is that. What happens there? That gets rounded down to 0. You're totally going to get the wrong answer. But it's positional. It's positional how it works. What if we had that? If y was a floating point number, then 
does this first, the result is a float. It does this first, the result is a float. And then, since we have a float and we're dividing it by three, we actually get the correct answer. So, yeah, depending upon the order. The order of multiplication should not matter, right? But it does. So you just got to be careful. Got to be careful to make sure that your ints, that if you're expressing a mathematical formula, I would not use ints as my constants. I would use floating point values to make sure that floating point math occurs. So anyways, when I said lesser type to greater type, there is a hierarchy of types. So from least complex to most complex, from lesser to greater, ints, longs, floats, doubles. And why is that? Because an int is smaller than a log, but they're both floating point types. An int can comfortably be stored in a log. A long can comfortably be stored in a float. There's no long that's so large that it can't be stored into a float. And a float can be stored in a double. So implicit conversion will never go the other way. A float will never be implicitly converted into a long because you could lose some data, right? It might be too large. It might have too large of an exponent to fit into a long, or it might you know, have 0.5 in it, and that would get lost. You could have data loss if implicit conversion would go from least, from, from greater to less. Now, the C programming language, C++, and it doesn't mind doing implicit conversion the other way. And Java refuses to compile code that is written that way, which is a good thing. You don't want data loss. You want to be warned that data loss will occur while you're writing the code. You can force the conversion, though, with casting. And I think I've already mentioned this. It's hard to remember what I've mentioned in this class versus C++. But if we had to convert from one format to another, we could. Like if we wanted to print line and we wanted to, you know, and we had some variable, but we really wanted it to be an int for some reason, we could do that. This is the key part of it here. That's the part. You specify the type in parentheses in front of it, and it takes x, no matter what x is, as long as it's a compatible, it, as long as it's a number, right? If it's a string, that's not going to work, and turns it into an int. That's called explicit casting rather than implicit casting. So compiler provides implicit casting from lesser types to greater, which we already said was promoting. It will refuse to demote, go from a greater type to a lesser, but you can force it with explicit casting. is equal to INTY, converts Y to an int, losing whatever data. You're saying that I accept responsibility for the fact that if Y was a floating point number, it's certainly not going to be a floating point number after that conversion happens, you know, or Z is equal to double, you know, you know whatever, convert to a double. And then, you know, you have care, which will float to convert to a care, you know, and you have longs, which will convert to a long, and float, which will convert to a long, right? You can cast into any of the existing data types. You cannot cast to a string, though. Casting only, uh, no, I won't say that, but you can't cast a number to a string. You have to convert it via some other process. And you can't cast a string to a number. It instead has to be parsed. Cast from a string to a number or vice versa. Instead, you have to parse. So when the Java virtual machine performs division of floating point numbers, it does so-called calculator division. Right? If you type in 1 divided by 2 on your calculator and you hit enter, it's not going to give you 0. 
it does floating point division because that's what we humans want to see when we're holding a pocket calculator. Calculator division. But if one part, if they're both integers, then the result is an integer and it gets rounded down. And it doesn't matter what it's being stored in. Like I said, if you do double d is equal to 1 divided by 6, this is done long before. Everything on the right-hand side gets done before any of this happens. It's not like it looks at this variable type and then decides what kind of math it's going to do over here. It's, this happens, and then finally, it's copied across. But it's an int, right? So it's coming over here, and it's being stored in a double at that point. I'm going to make this 12 divided by 6 at this point. So what is this equal to? It's equal to 2. When it's stored in a double, that's implicit casting. It was an int. It gets stored in a double, but that's okay. The compiler provide code from promoting an int to a double because an int will fit quite comfortably into a double. Using Chapter 3's operator precedent table. Well, you probably remember, and I've said this in every class I've taught, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Parentheses, exponents, and then multiplication and division happen, and then addition and subtraction happen. Now, this language doesn't support exponents, not Python. So, that's the order of operation. Things inside parentheses are forced to happen first. And then all forms of multiplication and division, which includes modulus. And then addition and subtraction. So based on that order, let's evaluate this expression. What's going to happen first? Well, the parentheses is forcing this stuff to happen first. Inside that grouping, what happens first? What's the higher order uh, operation? Division, right, so it's going to do x divided by y. x is 10, y is 5. They're both integers, so it's going to round down. 10 divided by 4 is 2 point something, rounded down is 2. Then it gets added to z, so 2 plus 6 is 8. And then, when they're all of the same precedence, which the rest of these are, because it's not like all multiplications happen before divisions, these are of equal priority. It just goes left to right. So that was, I, what was it, 10? 8. 8, okay, 8 divided by 10 is 0 0.8 times 2 is 1.6. Now, if I made an error while doing it in my head, that's fine, but that's the order in which you would do it. Okay, so 0 modulus x. Well, that's silly. 0 modulus anything is 0. So that's 0. We have something else in parentheses. 0 divided by x. That's also 0. Now that those two things have been done, we have a 0 on this side, we have a 0 on this side, and we're going to then do them in order because they're all additions at that point. And so 0 plus 6 plus 0 is equal to 6.0. I should give y'all a worksheet on that, but I'm assuming y'all know how to do it. I think it's in a quiz that will give you a little bit of practice. So as mentioned last time, plus plus means add 1 to your variable and store it back in your variable. So x equals x plus 1 can be rewritten x plus plus. And this actually runs faster, believe it or not. And why is that? Because when this expression runs, it has to do a memory lookup on the address of x twice. And so two reads in the memory are done to look up that address. And here, only one read is done. So that executes more quickly. Believe it or not, doing that runs faster still. Can't explain why, but compilers optimize that to run even faster. So if you want to write the fastest possible code, you would put xx in front if you can. The uh, there are two different versions of each one. You can do plus plus x, or you can do x plus plus. Both of them seem to do the same thing. If x is equal to six, then after that happens, the x will equal seven. 
And then after that happens, x will equal 8. But they're not interchangeable. And the reason why is because if the plus plus comes before the variable, if it's the prefix, it's the very first thing that happens in the expression. And if the plus plus follows the variable, it's the very last thing that happens in the expression. So if you had this, x is equal to 6, and then a is equal to 1 plus x plus plus. That means something deep different than if you had x equals 6, a is equal to, oh, that's looking lousy. Way too many pluses here. How about 1 times x plus plus? Which is silly, right? Okay, 2 times x plus plus, as opposed to 2 times plus plus x. You'd think they'd do the same thing, right? You'd think that this would get converted to 12. No, that it would turn into 7 because 6 plus 1 is 7, and then multiply by 2. You'd think that a was equal to 14. It's not. Well, in this case it might be, but uh, what happens is that if it's a suffix, it's the last thing that ha happens in the expression, meaning that this gets put off until the end. And so 2 times x is 12. And then x gets incremented. So by the time this is done, a equals 12, and then x is equal to 7. But if it's a prefix version, this is the very first thing that happens when the expression is evaluated. So this is immediately raised to 7, and then it's multiplied by 2. So a becomes 14. x still winds up being 7 when it's done. Now what would I do? I'd probably increase x before I did the, right? Or I'd do it separately. Because if I was going to do it this way, why not write it like this to make it clear? x is equal to 6, a is equal to 2 times x, and then x plus plus, right? It's just three lines of code. And if I wanted to write this one, I would do x is equal to 6, x plus plus, and then a is equal to 2 times x, right? That and that do the same thing. But then there's no ambiguity about what's being done first and what's not. But you'll learn it, yeah. If the plus plus is last, then it's the uh, last thing that happens in the expression. If the plus plus is first, it's the first thing that happens in the expression, even before parentheses and things like that. No, I can't say that's true. But before all the other mathematical operators. If you look up the uh, precedence chart, the total precedence chart, in Java, there's a lot more than just addition and subtraction. Parentheses are the highest. Square braces are a little bit lower. Shifting to the left and the right are lower than some of these things. Plus, plus, you know, the unary post increment happens. You know, yeah, anyways, you get the idea that uh, no, most of the time we don't have to worry about this, and I don't make y'all memorize that. I remember taking an employment test where they asked a whole bunch of these, you know, put these in order, and I was like, what the what? And you know, I probably got most of them right, but the, the ones that are important to us really are the mathematical operations. And if you write your expressions clearly and you don't mix a whole bunch of them up, then the order of operations don't really matter. I'm a fan of breaking them down if I need to. I'm also a fan of using parentheses to force things to be clear. So even if this is true, x is equal to 6, you know, if I have this, 6 times 3 plus 2 times 4, something like that, I'm not above doing that, right? Proving the point. Now, as a programmer, you'll probably will learn, if you don't already know, that the multiplication happens before the addition, and I wouldn't have to do it that way. But why not? If it, if it helps readability, there's nothing wrong with, with writing it like that. Now that one's kind of trivial. But if you have a longer expression and you can group them in parentheses and not just depend upon the next guy who comes along knowing the order of operations, you can also prevent problems because you might make a glitch. I just showed you that table, what, right, with uh, all those different order of operations for all those, you know, 
arcane operators. Make your code as easy to read as possible. Reduces errors, lets other people come along. So compound assignment operators I've mentioned. X plus equals 3 is the same thing as saying X equals X plus 3. X minus equals 4 is the same as saying X equals X minus 4. In writing a program, sometimes you need to convert data to a different type. Cast will do that. Here's the syntax. Now for you guys who stay in here and then take C++, you know that there are three at least different versions of casts in that language. In this one, there's only one, which is the parentheses followed by the variable type followed by the other parentheses. If you want to change this into dollars, feel free. Do that. Excuse me, not dollars. If you want to change something to an N, do that. So if you ever need to cast more than just a single variable, then make sure to put parentheses around the entire thing you want casted. If we left these parentheses out, casting happens before the rest of it. Payment would be turned into an int, and then cost would be subtracted from it. Well, payment was a double. We don't want it converted into an int until the whole thing has happened. So you group those two things together, and then you convert it into an int. I'm itching for us to type a little bit of code. And I want to make it a menu-based program, since one of our homework assignments is to write a menu-based program. So I'm going to fire up NetBeans, make a lecture E. I think that's what we're on, A, B, C, D, E. No, we're on F. So here's what I want my program to do. I'm just going to kind of blue sky it here. One, I want to be able to calculate I don't know area of a circle. That's one choice. Two, I want to be able to calculate the diameter of a circle based on its radius. And the last thing I want to be able to do is calculate the circumference of the circle. So what do I need to do? I need to ask the user what they want to do. And then I need to perform it. And so the asking of it is going to be an input statement. We're going to need a scanner. And then deciding which one we want to do is probably going to be a bunch of if-else-ifs. And we may want to let it loop until the user is done. So why don't we go ahead and throw a loop in? But first I'm going to create the scanner. Well, while we're here, let's say that one is going to be calculate the area of a circle, two is going to be calculate the diameter of the circle, three is going to be calculate the circumference, and zero is to quit. So we know we need a scanner. Scanner SC is equal to new. Scanner parentheses system with a capital S dot IN. You're going to have to add the import for the scanner. We could go up there and type it. Top line of code, import java.util.scanner. I'm fond of letting NetBeans do it, although it kind of makes you forget which uh, package contains which class. Saves time, though. Now we're going to need a loop control variable. The loop control variable dictates, right, is what the loop is based on. So, unfortunately, continue is not a loop, a good variable name. Why? Because it lit up in blue. Okay, that's not really why, because it's a keyword. So I'm not going to use continue as my variable name. I'm going to use repeat.
No, I'm not. I'm going to make a menu choice. How about int menu choice? And I'm going to set it equal to anything other than the sentinel value. The sentinel value is quit, so I better set it to anything other than that. So maybe I shouldn't have made it zero. Maybe I should have made this four and then run until, you know. So maybe I'll do that just because I'd like to instead be able to say it. Ah, I'm going to leave it alone. Okay. So while menu choice is not equal to zero, in other words, keep running until they choose zero. <coughs> now the book's going to show you one way of writing a while loop like this, and I, then I show you another. And I guess I'll show it to you in the book way, which is a way that I hate. But you're going to see it in the book. I'm going to show it here. And it's what's known as a priming read. And that's when you ask the question, no, I can't stand priming reads. I'm going to, I'm going to do it the way that I want. OK, so let's print out our menu. System.out.println. What do you want to do? And let's list the choices. Write one calculate area, two diameter. System.out.println. One equals area. Two equals diameter. Three equals circumference. Zero equals quit. And this is too long to fit on my screen, so I'm going to break it up. doing this. You don't have to. Because your font's smaller. So we're going to read it in, and I think we ought to use next int, since we're reading into an int. So let's do that. Menu choice equals SC. Previously, I was always calling the scanner IN. But then I started using SC because of it doesn't matter. Remember, variable names don't matter. I could call this variable Fred. And then as long as I use Fred down here, it would still work. So if some of your examples say IN.nextint and some days say SC.nextint, it's because variable names don't matter. Next int, as long as you use them, as long as you use the variable in the right place, doesn't matter what its name is. All right, what we want to rule out is that they chose quit. Because if they've chosen quit, we don't want to do one, two, three, four. So I think I'm just going to write some if statements. If choice is, oh, I wish I'd just use the word choice rather than menu choice because that's a lot of typing. We know we're going to also need to ask for the radius. I think I am, yeah, why don't we do this? If I hate asking, asking for the radius once in each block of code, but I'm probably going to wind up doing that, so I'm going to use a little bit of copy and pasting. If menu choice is equal equal to zero, in parentheses, System.out.println. Okay, goodbye. Now, I was a bad programmer and I didn't put braces around it, but if it's only one line of code, you can get away without using braces. Now, why did I do that? Just because it saves me two lines of code on the screen, it keeps two more lines. I'd recommend y'all put braces everywhere. Yeah, I could block off the entire next section. So that's a good idea. Let's do that. So else, and now we're going to do something if the menu choice is not equal to zero. We're going to check to see if it's one, two, or three. But we better ask for the radius first, right? Because we have all these choices. So let's do a print line to ask for the radius, and then let's use the scanner again. System.out.println. What is the radius? Question mark. Let's declare a radius variable. 
if you feel like declaring all your variables up at the top, then you can scroll back up and put it up at the top. I'm going to do it here. Double radius is equal to SC, our scanner, dot next double. And I hope y'all Python programmers appreciate the fact that you don't have to read it in as a string and then do the conversion yourself. But sooner or later, you're going to have to know how to do that conversion. And since it's a string that's coming in, you won't be able to use casting. All right, we have a radius. Now let's perform our check. If the area is equal to 1, if parentheses, area equal to the not area equal to one. Choice. What should I put there? Menu yep, menu choice. And the formula for the area of a circuit circle is pi r squared. So double area is equal to. Can we do math dot pi? Yeah, math dot pi. If you didn't remember that, you can just make a 3.14149, whatever. But this is slightly more accurate. Times radius times radius. Or if you feel like using the power of, you could use math.pow. Yes, sir. Oh, so, I'm so sorry. Yeah. If you ever get stuck on your formatting, I should show it to everybody. Control A, source, format. And right now it's following, I'll show it to everybody, it's following the rules configured with just to put the brace on the same line to represent the next one, but you can change it if you like. You go to tools, options. Okay, if you're starting to run into errors with brace placement, like it says reached into file while parsing, something like that, then uh, something you'll want to do is to highlight everything. You can use Control A or you can just click and sh you know do all that, Control A, and then hit source format. Now when you do that, it may put all the braces like that. It may do the, you know, the way that Oracle wants you to do it. And if that's the case, you're going to want to change your settings, if you care, to our style of brace placement. When I say our style, my style, and what the book uses. In which case, you go to Tools, Options, Editor, Formatting, and probably most of y'all have already done this. Category, Braces, and then tell every brace placement to be in a new line. If you don't 
like it, you can make them all on the same line. Yeah. Then, when I reformatted it, highlight everything, source, format. You see what it did? It put all of the brace placements in the way that I don't like. So I'm going to undo that. Go back to where it was. Options, editing, format, braces, new line, new line, new line, new line. If you don't care, that's fine. If you like this style, that's cool. But source format is the one that uh, you'll want to use if your brace placement starts getting hinky looking because quite often you can figure out what's going wrong, especially if you use your comments correctly, right? So like if I have a comment down here that this is the end of while, and then I have a comment down here that this is the end of method or end of main, and then I have a comment down here that this is the end of class, stuff like that. If I put um, helpful comments on it, then when I reformat it, suddenly it becomes clear to me what's wrong, or maybe, right? It's saying that this is the end of while. And I scroll up here, no, that's not a while loop there. And so hopefully I can figure out that I needed a uh, brace before that one in order to get it to work. Brace placement can be vexing. That's the only reason I'm spending five minutes talking about that. All right. So there we go. Double area, and then let's print out the area. System.out.println, print f. Let's make it fancy so that we can specify like down to two or three decimal places. The area is percent dot three, just to have three places after the decimal, f backslash n, end quote, comma, area. And you could just do if menu choice equals two, and then if menu choice is equal to three. I strongly recommend that if you have mutually exclusive choices, you use else if. It's just my recommendation. So else if menu underscore choice is equal to two. I'm just going to put a pair of braces there that I can fill in later. Else if menu underscore choice equals three. Again, I'm putting some braces there that I can fill in later. And then finally, the dangling else to catch if they type in an invalid choice, like five, six, seven, or eight, or whatever, else, and this one's going to be a print saying invalid choice. System.out.print line invalid choice. To get this to fit all on one page, I'm going to make a change to my formatting that I don't want you to make on yours. Because y'all have way more screen real estate than I do. Try to run it. <coughs> then I'll wander around and make sure it's working for y'all. Now it doesn't do anything if they choose two or three, right? So, but at least I'll be able to check to see if my skeleton is right. So I built it. I'm going to run it. It's asking me what I want to do: area, diameter, circumference, or quit. I'm going to calculate the area because I'm hoping that one works. Radius is 1, so the area ought to be 3.14. Yep. If you want more uh, decimal places, places after the decimal, you would change this percent dot 3f to a higher number. If you use percent f with no qualifier, just percent f with no dot 3 or anything like that. Oh, by the way, now that the program's running, how do I stop it from running without choosing quit? What if I just have to kill it because it's malfunctioning? Uh, stop. Are you stop running? Yeah, 
And you can click that, click to cancel, or maybe you can do a uh, stop from the debug up here. But I'm not seeing stop. Where, I mean, I don't see a stop option there, so I'm just going to click that, click to cancel. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was, it was the square part of the. Uh, you just kept squaring everything. Right. Yeah. So yeah, if you run it over and over and over, and I make some kind of change, and then I run it again, you can wind up with a whole bunch of processes running. It's not letting me do that right now, but then you just have to keep closing the X on all of them, get them to stop. If you're stepping to the debugger, you would use this stop. Um, you'd use a stop sign wherever the debugging options are. All right. I didn't test my quit option. I'm going to do it now. Test. What do I want to do? I want an area. Radius is 99. It tells me a big number. Oh, here's what I was illustrating. If you don't specify a floating point, it'll go out up to six places. Point you know, six places after that. That's why I had it point three to make it look a little bit better. I'm going to type in something invalid, six. It should tell me that. Did it not? Did I forget to, did I forget to handle that option? Well, what do you know? It's at the end of the uh, statement, isn't it, the last one else? Go to the bottom. Just it's still tighten it up. Oh, yeah, I, I get it. Right, it's asking for the radius before it rules out that it's a bad decision. All right, I can fix that. I'm not gonna. That's dumb enough that I'm tempted to comment that out. But uh, yeah, that's it's dumb the way I've structured it. Why? Because it asks for the radius before we rule out that the menu choice is acceptable. All right. I'd like you all to take a stab at finishing this, and I'll wander around and help. But what is the formula for calculating the diameter from the radius? Well, if the radius of a circle is 1, what's the diameter of it? Come on, somebody's taking geometry. Twice the radius. Yeah, it's two times. Okay, so um, in this case, circumference is equal to 2 times radius. And if we're talking about, no, not circumference, no, diameter. diameter. And then if we're talking about circumference, it's uh, 2 pi r.